I want to welcome you, but also call you in and let you find a seat and get ready because we're going to worship God through song and through His Word, of course. Now, before we do, I have a couple of announcements I want to share with you this morning and keep you updated with some of the events and the dates that are coming up that are maybe important to remember and be part of as a church family. So uh, the first thing that's kind of new, but yeah, it's been part of our church happening in the past, is our pre-service prayer time. So I know many of you were involved with our pre-service prayer before COVID, and we're bringing it back. And the idea is just to come out before service starts at 945 and just take part in some worship time, about half an hour worth of, wor- uh, sorry, of prayer time. And uh, Carl Wilson's kind of heading it up right now. And so if you'd like to come out and be part of that prayer time, it's open to anybody and everyone who's willing to come out. So 945 on Sunday mornings. Secondly, our baby bottle campaign for Norfolk Pregnancy Center is still on, so you can find those baby bottles out in the front hallway, take them back home, fill them up with change or whatever money you have laying around, bring them back to the church by uh, June 25th. That'd be great. We'll take them out and give them to the Norfolk Pregnancy Center. Thirdly, we're looking for some volunteers for the gardens. So if you want to help with our gardening, talk to Ruth Ann. Uh, McMillan, and she's putting together a schedule and list for uh, helpers and volunteers. In line with the idea of gardening, though, I'd also make mention that we actually have some veggie plants at the front of the church in the front entrance way here that have been dropped off by uh, Carrie Verbinen, and she's just let us know that anyone can take whatever plants they want to take home for veggies, or Ruth Ann can grab some for the boxes out uh, for the gardens as well. Uh, but if you'd like to help volunteer for our gardens, talk to Ruth Ann or talk to myself, we'll get you involved in the weekly watering and weeding schedule. Uh, fourthly, we have VBS coming up July 24th to 28th. I know it's still a month and a half or so away, but it's going to come up quickly. And our registration is available online. That'll get added to the church website in the next couple of days. So look out for that as well. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer, we're in, we're in need of about 30 volunteers for our VBS. So if you'd like to volunteer and help us out, uh, let us know. Volunteering involves uh, supervising kids, going along with the different groups from station to station, or if you want to be a little bit more intensive in your volunteering and put yourself to work even harder, you can lead a station, help with the crafts, help with the games, help with the music, and all sorts of things. Uh, Fifthly, our baptism service is coming up very soon, just a couple of weeks away. And so I just wanted to give a reminder to the church family that on June 18th, church service is happening at the Waterford Ponds, uh, the Waterford Conservation North uh, camping area. And there's a beach area and a pavilion that we have rented for the entire day. And so we encourage you to come out and uh, join us for church there at 1030 on that Sunday morning. The, The time and the church service itself will look exactly the same as usual, just a different place being outdoors at the ponds there. So bring a chair. Uh, If you want to take part in the potluck afterwards, bring some kind of food, maybe a a main course or a salad uh, or dessert for afterwards. And we're going to have a picnic uh, at the pavilion afterwards too. So you're more than welcome to join us, invite your friends and family for that. If you're interested in baptism, please talk to me and I'll give you some of the information and details necessary for going through the waters of baptism and joining uh, that part of the service at the end. Um, a couple more. We, we've had a couple of uh, new members come into membership over the last uh, week after the business meeting last week, and so I just wanted to um, thank them and encourage them and say congratulations. So we want to mention Bruce and Ruth Ann McMillan and uh, Beverly Miles. So we want to welcome them into the church family that way, and if you have a chance to say congratulations or shake their hand or encourage them sometime this morning, please do so. We're just thankful that God uh, blesses in this way and brings people on board into the church family to take part in all sorts of ways. And then uh, lastly, we want to mention a little bit of the project that the missions committee has been doing. They've been meeting for the last couple of months now. And one of the things they want to initiate here at the church is every so often to have a missionary of the month. And uh, so if you could remember them in your prayers... And uh, they've been in the missions field for, I think, 35 plus years, or maybe, you know, much longer even. But 
one of the things to remember is just because they're veterans in the mission field, they still need just as much prayer and as much support as anybody else. And so they've been doing a lot of really good work out there. And so we can remember them in prayer this morning, remember them maybe throughout the week. There's a nice little display at the front and the back for the Missionary of the Month. Um, and if you'd like some more information about who they are, like a little card handout, you can find those in the front hallway as well. Well, as we go to the Lord in worship and we thank Him for all of the many things He's doing, not only here but around the world, let's stand together and we'll open up our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you this morning with grateful and thankful hearts, uh, praying that you would prepare us now to come into your presence and to be um, sincere worshipers that our hearts would be overflowing with love for who you are and what you've done for us, but that you in turn would bless us by speaking to us and encouraging us and strengthening us. We thank you for the, the many efforts of ministry that are happening here at WCC and, and in this community by so many of the volunteers. We thank you for new members coming on and, and for the, the, the many things we can be thankful for. And we pray, Father, now that you would just Revive our hearts, refresh us, and focus us on who you are, and importantly, what you've done through your son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. morning, church family. It's great to be with you. I hope it's an encouragement to sing those words together, to say that we are committed together in service to the Lord. We're going to celebrate our Lord this morning by singing, Our God, and There is a Fountain, in preparation for the message this morning. So let's continue our worship and praise of our Lord Jesus.
seated, we'll have our kids video at this time. In a land called Ephraim, a man named Elkanah lived with his wife Hannah. Hannah was sad because she really wanted children, but she didn't have any. Every year, Elkanah went to the tabernacle to make sacrifices to God and to worship him. Hannah went with him. She prayed, Lord, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. He will serve you all of his life. A priest named Eli sat nearby and watched Hannah pray. He couldn't hear her, but he saw her lips moving. Eli thought something was wrong with Hannah. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord, she explained. So Eli replied, go in peace. May God answer your prayers. Hannah and Elkanah returned home and God answered her prayers. After some time, Hannah gave birth to a son. She named the baby Samuel. When Samuel was a little older, Hannah took him to Eli at the tabernacle. God answered my prayers, she said. Hannah pledged Samuel to serve God and she worshiped God. Then Hannah went back home and left Samuel with Eli to serve God. Every year, Hannah returned with a new robe for Samuel. God gave Hannah many more children too. One night, Eli was in his bed and Samuel was lying in the tabernacle when Samuel heard someone call his name. Here I am, Samuel replied. He ran to Eli. Here I am, you called me. But it wasn't Eli. He told Samuel to go back to bed. God called Samuel three times and each time Samuel ran to Eli. Here I am, he said. Eli finally understood that God was calling to Samuel. He told Samuel how to respond. So Samuel went back to his place and God called, Samuel, Samuel. This time Samuel spoke up, speak for your servant is listening. God told Samuel that he was going to judge Eli's family for their sin. Eli's sons served as priests in the tabernacle, but they were sinning against God. The next day, Samuel was afraid to tell Eli what God had said, but he shared God's message with Eli. As Samuel grew, God was with him. Everyone in Israel knew that Samuel was God's messenger. God used Samuel to share his plan with the nation of Israel. Hannah trusted God and sent Samuel away from home to serve God with his whole life. God sent Jesus from heaven to earth to be our savior. Just as Samuel used God's words to tell people about God, Jesus, the word who became flesh, perfectly shows us what God is like. Thanks to make their way out for Junior Church this morning. As they go into junior church, we're going to take up God's word together. And before we do, why don't we just bow in a word of prayer? We'll commit this time to Him. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us the discernment necessary. We need you. We need you to speak to us. We need to be able to hear from you, to be able to understand your word and uh, apply it to our lives. So this morning, we pray that you indeed would intervene into our lives, and that we might respond with thankful hearts, but also with a willingness to hear and obey. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open them up to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Before I read that passage of Scripture, though, I want to read another passage of Scripture that I think carries tremendous weight onto the text that we're going to look at this morning. In the New Testament, in James, the book of James, Sue in the video was talking about James, the brother of Jesus, who was killed as one of the pastors of the church in Jerusalem. This is the book that he wrote, and he writes this. Each person 
is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The two thoughts that I want to begin with this morning for us to bring to bear on the text of David's life, late, or much earlier, of course. Full grown, when sin is full grown. Full grown, not simply meaning aged, as in it's gone on for some long period of time. Full grown, though, as in it's come to a natural end. It's this word telos in Greek, and it's used all throughout the New Testament as well to refer to other things. But interestingly, this is the only time when James talks about, or sorry, when the Bible talks about it in this kind of way, the end of sin. What does it produce? Oh, this other thought, death, as in not only physical death going into the grave, but death as in spiritual separation from God. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. But last week, we dealt with the sin of David's adultery with Bathsheba in the beginning of chapter 11. Now, what is he going to do in light of her becoming pregnant? That was the last verse we had read in verse 5. It says, And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Now, what is David going to do? The question for us then is, when our desires give birth to sin, how will we respond? James gives us this great warning. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. The sin, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. Will we repent and turn to God and try to make amends with the person we've wronged, or will we dig in? Will we double down and seek to cover up? I think you know where I'm going with this because that was the example in life of David, unfortunately, here in chapter 11. Such a painful and sad response to his sin. Rather than turning to God right away, he goes down this road and he sins grievously against this man, Uriah. So I'm going to read for you 2 Samuel 11, verses 6 through 17, and then verses 26 and 27. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word or uh, on the words that are going to be up on the screen. So starting in verse 6. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When David came to him, or sorry, when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a long journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark of Israel and Judah dwells in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate at his presence, in his presence, and drank so that he made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, to set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there, would, there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Now verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. 
And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now you might be thinking, why, oh why, are we discussing this passage of Scripture? Seems like one that maybe in the life of David we could just skim over. Maybe have a passing word. And, oh yes, so David had this unfortunate event with Bathsheba and Uriah. But then maybe move on to the more impressive instances and events of his life. Well, the reason that we're here is because, well, this incident with Bathsheba and David and Uriah, it transpires over a number of chapters, actually, so we're going to be here for a few weeks, but the Word of God presents us with the ugly side of even the heroes of our faith for a reason. And I think the one pastor that I was looking into this past week as I was studying Paul Tripp he said it really well. He said, every part of your Bible is intended to rescue you from you. That's why we're reading this, and that's why we're taking time and spending it in an uncomfortable place of God's Word as we learn more about sin and we see the direction and path of sin and how now, as we read from James 1, when sin is full-born and full-grown, sorry, I should say, it brings forth death. And this was the tragic end of Uriah. When David's sin was full grown, it ends in death. So not just the death of Uriah, but in weeks to come, we'll find the death of his son born from Bathsheba. So then, what can we learn from this passage? If every part of our Bible is intended to rescue us from ourselves, what can we learn from David going down this road, rather than repenting and turning to God, he just doubles down and tries to cover his sin. Well, my aim this morning is that we would learn this, that we would fully see what sin looks like once it's fully formed, fully grown, that we would seek to avoid, repent, and become obedient to God in light of the ugliness of this fully formed sin. So full grown, how does sin become full grown? Yes, there was the act of adultery that already took place in the life of David, and that was bad enough, but David could have stopped there. He could have repented then and there. He could have turned. He could have made amends with Uriah, done what was necessary to make things right, but he doesn't. He doubles down, and he digs in, and he continues to try to cover and hide and manipulate everything that was done. So how does sin grow and grow? and grow until it's full-grown, the point of death. Well, firstly, look at the example of David. Look what happens in his life. Firstly, he entices Uriah. He entices him. In verses 8 and 9, look what the Bible says. It says, David says to Uriah. Now, David calls Uriah from the battlefield. Remember that the, the armies of David were out doing war because it was the springtime, David wasn't out doing war, though, himself, personally. He was back home, and therein lied a bit of the trouble. Because he was home from war, he sees what he saw, and he takes Bathsheba and does that sin of adultery with her. And so now we are at this point where David realizes something must be done, realizes Bathsheba is pregnant. Now, what is he going to do? Well, he entices Uriah. He brings him back from battle. And he says, go down to your house and wash your feet. It says, Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. David's trying to entice Uriah to do something. It says, though, Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. But David's strategy is straightforward. He's trying to cover his tracks. It reminds us again, as we mentioned last week, of the Garden of Eden. And immediately after Adam and Eve sinned against God in the Garden, what do they do? They hide. Now, David isn't just blatantly trying to hide, maybe not as obviously as Adam and Eve were, but make no mistake, he's, he's hiding. He's trying to hide something.
So David's strategy is straightforward. He calls Uriah back home and he says, Uriah, go down to your house, sleep. And as he's leaving the palace, there's a gift that follows Uriah. Again, David's strategy is straightforward. Go home, be with your wife. Here's a gift. You can celebrate that you're home and you're not at battle. And I think if anyone has passed biology, basic biology in high school, or if your parents gave you the, the birds and the bees talk, you know exactly what David's trying to do, right? Bathsheba is pregnant. Maybe if Uriah goes home and sleeps with his wife, maybe, maybe he'll believe the child is his. Now, there's a lot of speculation we could do. It could very well be that there were rumors and hints that something was going on back home. We don't know exactly. But David's plan is quite straightforward. He, he wants to deceive. Uh, he wants to do something to cover up the sin. He knows it's going to be found out at some point. And why he's so afraid, of course, is because, well, Bathsheba's back home. Uriah's off the battle. Something's got to give. <coughs> but Uriah is too honorable to do what David asks. See, instead of going home and taking his gift and spending time with his wife, he stays and he camps out at the door of the palace with the servants. And the next morning when David says, well, Uriah, why didn't you go home and why didn't you spend time with your wife? You know, you've been on a long journey coming back from battle and you've been out and that must have been very tiresome and hard for you. Why didn't you go and spend time with your wife? What does Uriah say? Look what he says in verse 11. Uriah says to David, the ark of Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my lord Joab... And the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to live or to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. This Uriah is too honorable to do what David was. You notice the line that Uriah uses at the end. <coughs> I will not do this thing. That should have been David's line. Right? That should have been what David said. David, you know, as we studied last week, he saw, he inquired, he took, and he lay with Bathsheba. At any one of those moments, David could have said to himself in his own heart, I will not do this thing. At any moment, even now, with Uriah being back home, David could have said, I will not do this thing. He knew what his heart and his mind were contriving. He knew where he was about to go with this. The path to covering up sin begins with a seemingly tepid suggestion. David merely suggests something. He's not trying to bend Uriah to his will, per se. He's not forcing the obvious, but he's doing something. Suggesting. Go down. Go into your house. The very first thing we ought to see then with sin growing and as it grows and can become full grown, sin grows through manipulation and deceit. Sin grows through manipulation and deceit. This was the first stop off in David after he had sinned. He knows he's going to try to do something to stop it or to stop the deed from being revealed. So the very first thing he does to cause sin to grow he manipulates and he controls. He suggests. He devotes time and energy to covering up. I want you to think about this. There's been a time in your life when you've fallen in sin. What is your response? One thing that we could do is we could immediately think and be tempted to cover up. And oftentimes when we are tempted to do so, the covering up well, begins small, seemingly tepid. I'm just going to make a suggestion. I'm just going to turn a blind eye. Or maybe I'll be passively involved at trying to steer people away from seeing what I did. But make no mistake, there is a devotion time and energy spent in trying to stop the thing 
from being revealed. Now, I want you to think in your own life, have I ever spent time and energy concealing sin? Have I ever spent time and energy covering it? It may have been as simple as a suggestion or passively trying to move people's attention here or there, doing something. But make no mistake, when you make this first move, your sin is growing. It's moving out. And maybe the lie that you're believing is, I can stop it right here, just like David thought. This is a little suggestion, Uriah. Come home, go back to your house for a little while. Uriah is too honorable for that. He knows the Ark of the Covenant is in booths. He knows my, my comrades out in the field, the military, they're camping in an open field. How could I possibly go and camp in my own house or live in my own? I'm not going to do that. So he refuses to. And at this point, it's hard to say whether Uriah knew anything that was going on or not. Who knows? Jerusalem is a small town at this point. Uriah refuses. So secondly, David goes this extra step. After he hears that Uriah uh, didn't go and stay with his wife that night, he does something else. He says, Uriah, okay, well, stay here today and tomorrow we'll send you back. What does he do with Uriah that night? He invites him to eat with the king. An honorable thing. You can imagine Uriah, maybe Bathsheba hears about this and is, oh, this is interesting what David's doing. I wonder what's going to take place now, what's going to happen. Uriah goes and he eats with David. It's to eat at his table, but David has this ulterior motive, of course, right? What does he do? He's trying to get Uriah drunk. Well, the text doesn't come right out and say it, but again, anyone who's passed basic biology, I think, understands what's going on here. The psychology of the human mind is interesting, isn't it? And although the narrator doesn't come right out and say it, the obvious truth is he's trying to get Uriah drunk so that he'll have fewer inhibitions, then maybe he won't be so morally grounded and want to sleep outside, but maybe he'll wander and wobble his way back home, and then he'll lay with his wife, and then he'll be none the wiser. It's interesting, though. David should have known better. The Word of God gives us all these warnings about drunkenness and all these warnings about the temptation of sin. The book of Ecclesiastes says, Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility. And David wasn't acting very noble right now. And your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Now David is using something that should have been done in a celebratory manner when God had given a great victory, perhaps. But now he's celebrating at a time when Uriah was probably scratching his head. Why are we celebrating? Why are we eating? Why are we drinking? Something's off here. There is manipulation, and there's something going on under the water. And David is getting drunk and forcing Uriah to get drunk for a reason. It reveals to us the utter disgrace of what David is doing. And he knows exactly what he's doing. And the unfortunate truth is that David is doing something that he once prayed to God that his enemies, that he'd be delivered from his enemies doing the same thing to him. You know, in Psalm chapter 59, David prays this. This is when Saul, the former king, was seeking David's life. He says in Psalm 59, 1 and 2, Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. When David is praying to God, he's in a situation where he knows there's only one way out of this, God delivers me. And Saul was seeking his life. Saul was spreading rumors. And Saul was contriving to end David's life. And David says, deliver me from those kind of men. David had become that kind of person. Now think about this. David would have penned Psalm 59 sometime in between Saul trying to kill him and him becoming king now, that means David likely penned Psalm 59 before the events of him with Bathsheba and Uriah. 
Think about that. David penned Holy Scripture about how he wanted God to deliver him from the same kind of person that he would later become. And then somewhat prophetically, that same psalm, David goes on to say this in verse 12, For the sins of their mouths and the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. Think about how David would have penned those words so long before the sin with Bathsheba and what he was about to do to Uriah. And think about how he says, in light of what Saul is doing to me, trying to kill me, may you trap him in his own pride, God. And God would do just that with Saul. But God knows in his omniscience, in his perfect knowledge, one day, David, this prayer is going to, be, it's going to come upon your own head. And the same curse you uttered against Saul, you're going to suffer it as well. And David is going to be trapped in the sin of his own pride. And we're going to see that in chapter 12 as the prophet Nathan comes and visits him. But for this morning, I want you to notice, as sin is growing, sinful scheming turns from manipulation to abuse. There's this movement away from mere words. But David was just saying things to Uriah at one point. Why don't you go down to your house? How was the battle? I heard it was difficult. How's Joab doing? How are the rest of the men doing? Oh, by the yeah, go, go down to your house. Here's a gift to encourage you to go. The sinful scheming turns from just words to this kind of abuse where David actually crosses a line and inflicts some kind of damage on another person in order to get his way. Now, in the eyes of some people, it might have seemed minor. Well, he just got him drunk, you might say. But what was he doing? He was trying to manipulate the very mind and body of Uriah. Sin grows through this active tampering. Before, David was just willing to make suggestions to cover sin. Now he's gone across the line into tampering, into altering something or someone. And in our own lives, I want us to think then, when sin is born and we've done something wrong before God, what do we do? What's our response? We might make these somewhat tepid suggestions to conceal and cover. But then the second point, the second step we might go to is actively tampering, actively trying to push or pull people one way or another getting rid of evidence, removing things, changing things. We're going beyond just lying. We're going beyond just concealing to tampering. And it oftentimes plays out in damaging ways towards other people. People's reputations get thrown under the bus. People themselves have some alter. Something changes in them because I've done something. Sin is growing. We're not quite point to the point of death yet, but it's growing. And you can see the trajectory where David's going. Something seemed harmless at first. Now he's moving. He's a little bit more hands-on. And now this final step. Thirdly, he writes a letter to Joab. Put Uriah on the front line. Look at the audacity of David. Look what it says in verse 14. In the morning, David realizes, of course, that Uriah did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter. Oh, and since Joab was right there at the door of the palace, you seem like a really good messenger to take it to Joab. He wrote a letter, and he sent it by the hand of Uriah. Think about that. Uriah is arguably a good friend of David. We know this because he's one of the mighty men who's been with David for a long, long time. One of the guys who showed support to David right from the beginning. And he's been fighting battles for David, with David. He's clearly a man who's honorable. He's a man of integrity. He won't do the thing 
that he maybe kind of suspects David wants him to do, he refuses. So David writes a letter. Okay, I can't get my way. My suggestions are going unheard. I'm trying to manhandle and tamper and push him one way, but he's not doing it. So I'm going to write a letter. Put him on the front lines. And you know what? I'm going to put it in the hands of Uriah, and Uriah is going to take it to Joab, the commander. He's putting a, hand, a letter in the hands of one of his good friends, one of his faithful servants. And the very letter that he puts in the hand of Uriah is the letter that will be responsible for his death. Now, I don't know about you, but I wonder if Uriah was at all tempted to open that letter. Have you ever had a letter that wasn't addressed to you, but maybe it came to you by mistake? It's in my hands. Oh, what am I going to do with this? Hey, well, simple solution is give it to the person who it belongs to. But for a few fleeting moments, we wonder, well, what's in here? I, exactly. It's not a bill. It's handwritten. Oh, okay. Hold it up to the light. Oh, what's going on? Of course, we can't open it because then they'll know that we opened it. Uriah can't open it either because he knows it's got the seal of the king on it. Joab will know. I wonder if he thought, David's up to no good here. But in his integrity, and because he was an honorable man, he takes that letter, sealed to Joab, doesn't look at it, doesn't wonder, hands it over, and then the next thing he knows, he's on the front lines, fighting. And look at the sneakiness and the maliciousness of it. It says in verse 15, Set Uriah at the forefront of the hardest fighting, then draw back from him. So basically, him and a few other guys are going to die. They're going to die alone on the battlefield. Go up to battle, put him on the front lines, and then pull back without telling him. It also makes you wonder, you know, not only is Joab complicit in this, which is pretty bad, but a bunch of other guys had to be somewhat complicit too, Imagine Joab out on the battlefield. He's the general. And he tells, he's got to tell other guys, hey, here's Uriah. He's going to go with you up to the front. And then we're going to give some signal to pull back. Don't tell Uriah. Like a bunch of people had to know about this. So like, look at what David's doing. He's, his sin is leading to death, but he's putting other people in the line of a fire as well. He's dragging Joab into it, who already wasn't the greatest guy. We know that from other readings. He has to have brought other guys into it as well. When you go to the forefront of the battle, pull back, and a bunch of guys had to be involved in this. And David's sin finally results in what James tells us in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. When it's full grown, it brings forth death. Finally, this time, his plan works. David sinks as low as you can go, killing a trusted servant, to cover his own sin. Well, if he won't go down to the house to lie with her, my only resort is this. I've got to kill him. What's going to happen if he finds out? And ultimately, he gets what he wants in the end. Look what it says in verse 27. When the mourning for Uriah was over, David sent and brought her to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Have you ever gotten what you wanted but realized it wasn't good? Have you ever gotten what you wanted but realized it wasn't really what you desired? I wonder what David was thinking all the way back in verses 1 through 5. Don't know exactly how long ago it was time-wise. Probably not that long ago for David. But I wonder what he had thought maybe those few weeks earlier when he saw Bathsheba. Did he think, if I go and I commit this sin, it's going to result in one of my good friends being killed by my own hand? I wonder if he thought that. I don't think he did. I think maybe he thought in his pride and his ambition and in his desire, I can get away with this. He knew that Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, so he must have thought, if word gets back to Uriah, I've got to deal with that somehow. 
He must have thought, he must have been contriving, he must have had some basic idea or plan. But now when the word comes back to him, I am pregnant, he realizes, I've got to do something. And sin, it's born and now it's growing and growing and growing. And every step of the way, David allows that sin to grow further and further. It expands its influence. It expands the range of, of damage that it inflicts on others. Until finally, at its end, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. Sin is now full grown in David's life. He's gone beyond suggestions, manipulation, and tampering. Now he's willing to do anything to cover his sin. I think it's a testament to the power and intoxication that sin has in someone's life. It doesn't matter who you are. If you let it grow, it will lead to death. I think one of the most challenging parts of reading a text like this is not so much the actions and intentions themselves. I think, unfortunately, what David does is actually somewhat commonplace in our world. It doesn't really make it very shocking, does it? On the one hand, yeah, we don't really feel comfortable talking about sin. But on the other hand, we see sin like what David does in our world. It's not that uncommon. And so when we read a text like this, we're left wondering, well, okay, yes, David did something bad. But the, the, the surprising and the difficult thing about reading a text like this is unfortunately... Not the act itself, but who did it. It's who did it. We read this and we wonder, okay, David, you, you, yeah, you took Bathsheba and you committed adultery and that was wrong and you, you did that even though you knew who she was. But stop. At any moment you could stop. At any moment you could say in your heart as Uriah did, I will not do this thing. But he kept going. I think the challenging part of a text like this is not the act itself, as bad as that is. It's who did it. David, the hero up until this point. Over the last two books of First and Second Samuel, all he's done is good and mighty and powerful things. He's been faithful to God. Even from a youth, he stood in front of Goliath. From a young man, he ran from Saul, but refused to stretch out his hand against Saul, think about that. When a man was seeking David's life and he had opportunity to kill him, he refused. And now, when David is buried beneath the guilt and shame of his sin, that is when he's willing to strike out his hand. The church, that should tell us a lot about the power and the intoxication of sin. Even for a man like David, who is upright and faithful in all so many other ways, these moments of failing and pride and selfishness and sin, they compound themselves when David feels there's no other way. See, when he was in the cave and Saul was standing in front of him and he had an opportunity to kill him, he knew there were other ways. He knew, oh, uh, Saul will survive this and God will continue to protect me. But it's when he's faced with his own sin and guilt and shame and he feels there's no other way. There's absolutely no other way. Something he would never consider doing. I bet you if you asked him in his teenage years and in his 20s, I bet you even if you asked him the day before he saw Bathsheba, David, would you kill a man? Would you kill a man for your own sin? He would say, never. I'd never do something like that. There's a little bit of speculation, of course. The point is, we don't know what we're capable of and what we would do until we're in that moment. And that's exactly what the Bible is trying to do for us. Rescue us from ourselves. Remind us that you don't know what you're capable of. I don't know what I'm capable of. Lord, protect us from those moments Father, give us the strength to say stop, to say I will not do this thing. 
When sin is full grown, it brings forth death. John Owen, one of the famous 17th century Puritans, he said it this way, be killing sin or it will be killing you. So where do we go from here? What are we to do about this? Let me close by giving you a few suggestions coming from the Word of God in the book of Romans. Because I realize as we end in the passage of Scripture in 2 Samuel, that passage we read this morning doesn't really end on a positive note. Let me take you to the New Testament, to the book of Romans, where we find some very important truth about where we're to go from here. If we ever find ourselves in David's position. Or should we seek to guard ourselves from David's position? Romans 6, verses 21 to 22. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The Apostle Paul is reminding us about the life that we were once engulfed in, a life dominated by sin. He said, what were you getting from that life? Those things that bring shame and guilt. Ultimately, he's saying, what did you get out of sin? He says, those things, the end of those things is death. It's the same word used, actually, in the book of James that we read earlier at the beginning of the message. When sin is fully grown, it's that same root word, telos, that James used. What's the end result of sin? Death. The Apostle Paul says it in a slightly different way, but he uses the same word. He says, what's the end? Of those things. It's death. That's the bad news. That's where David was at. And imagine the prophet Nathan, if he had been a little bit more straightforward, he comes to David, as many of you know, and he gives him a bit of a story. He gives him an analogy. And at the end of it all, David realizes, I am that man. We're going to get to that next week. And imagine if Nathan was a little bit more straightforward, like the apostle Paul had been. He would have just said to David, David, what did your sin get you? All it got you was death. That's where David is right now. But where could he go from there? Where could we go? Well, the Apostle Paul goes on and says this, But now, now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. A complete reversal of the curse. A complete reversal of the deeds that I committed. Not because I turned the corner. Not because I somehow did enough good things to outweigh those bad things. But he says, but now that you have been set free from sin. How did you get set free from sin, church? It wasn't because you did something. It wasn't because you bore your own sin on the cross. It wasn't because you did something like David. You didn't try to cover or atone for your own sin by hiding it. You're set free from your sin because of the work of Christ. Because He died on your behalf, which was the penalty we deserved. Because the end result of sin is death. Christ dies in our place to make us children of God, to set us free from sin. The fruit we get now that we know Christ, now that we're in Christ, now that we have faith in Christ, the fruit we now get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Two things then as we end, church. Number one, see the end of sin. You need to know and see the end of sin. You need to know what it is. You need to have no misunderstanding in your mind and your heart as to what sin will result in. There is no other option. There is no other path. There is no other end. There is no other telos, as James or Paul would say. There is no other final solution to sin other than death. doesn't matter how great or small. 
It doesn't matter how innocuous or tepid your uh, attempt to conceal the sin was or how egregious or abusive or terrifying your lies and deceit are to try to hide the sin. It doesn't matter how great or small, how important or unimportant you may feel. Sin always leads to death. We have to see that. It's one of the first ways that we're able to be guarded against the temptation to conceal and hide. It's one of the first ways that God warns us and reminds us, you do not want the fruit of that path. You don't want that. You might think you can cover it. You might think you can change it. You might think you can go for a while and nobody will know. You might think you can go your whole life and nobody will know. God will know. And the end of that life is death. So number one, see the end of sin, which is death. This should cause a deep desire to avoid it. A deep desire, church, to avoid it. Hopefully everybody who reads the message of, of David and Bathsheba and Uriah, hopefully everybody who reads that couldn't help but think to themselves, I do not want that for me. I don't want to be there. And if I am there, thank God that I have Christ to turn to for forgiveness. But I don't want to be there. Not simply a, oh, well, it's too bad for David. Sure hope he learns to turn this around. Oh, that was really bad for David, but you know, in chapter 12 and 13, he's going to repent and it'll all be better again. Hopefully that is not the mindset we have when we read this account of David and Bathsheba and Uriah. Hopefully the thing we come away with is this deep desire to avoid everything David did. In all of its intricacies, in all of its complexities, in all of its subtleties, church, that we would avoid everything David did. And then secondly, to be reminded that you are a servant of the Most High King. According to Romans chapter 6, verse 22, the end of your life is not destined for death. The fruit of your life is not destined for death, but is destined for sanctification and eternity, this eternal life that God has promised. So in light of those things, we ought to practice life-giving acts as our Father has given us new life. You're a child of the King. David was a child of the King as well, and yet he stumbled and fell, and he acted in a way that was contrary to his image, the image of his Father. And see, church, this might be true for us. We might find ourselves in the same position as David. We may have even done the exact same thing that David did, though I hope not. But if you find yourself there, if you find yourself even spiritually speaking in the same spot as David, what you ought to know is God has given a way forward. In His grace and in His mercy, He has given us what we don't deserve, which is a way to life. He has reversed the curse he has taken our lives and He's put it on a new trajectory. He's changed our lives from a trajectory of death to a trajectory of life. And my hope is that's what you remember, that we would remember these two things, that we would have this deep desire to avoid what David did. But given that we all sin and given that we all find ourselves in some way, shape, or form in David's shoes, that we would repent and turn to Christ and understand the wonderfully encouraging news of the gospel. He has brought new life. And he will bring David new life as well. Even though David doesn't deserve it. Even though anyone, humanly speaking, if we had the opportunity to judge David, and I think just about if anyone had the opportunity to judge David, they might and ought to condemn him to death for what he did. In fact, the Old Testament law ought to have condemned David to death. But what does God do? God brings forth the fruit of new life. And He can do the same thing in your heart and life as well. See the end of sin, but see the grace of God. And practice the life-giving acts that our Father has destined us to live in.
So church family, what does sin look like when it's full grown? It looks like death. And you, your life will either come to be defined by that death or you will accept the death that was offered on your behalf, Christ, and you'll live new life. It's to Him we go now as we open up or we, we come to the Lord's Supper and we're reminded of what He's done for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads. These are hard truths, Father, to process. Let's not kid ourselves. When we reflect on our own hearts and lives, the easiest thing to do is to turn a blind eye. It's to brush things under the rug, figuratively speaking. It's to compare ourselves to other people. I'm not as bad as them. I certainly didn't do what David did. Father, help us to not escape from our own justification. Help us to see ourselves in light of your word. Your word is intended to rescue us from ourselves. Father, in these deep and difficult things that we've studied this morning, help us to see our own sin, but help us to see the path of grace that you've set before us. And we thank you, Lord, for that gift. Encourage us. Lift us up, Lord, from the depths of despair and guilt and shame. Help us to see that your arms are wide open to give us new life. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, church family, we are going to go into the time where we take up the Lord's Supper, and we do this once a month, typically on the first Sunday of the month. So at this time, I'm going to ask that we spend a few moments just preparing our hearts and minds before the Lord. And what I mean by that is that we would take a few moments just to pause in silent prayer and reflection together and bring our hearts before God and ask ourselves, even as David would do in light of what he had done to Uriah. Create in me a clean heart, O God. This is what we desire. As we come before God, as we are about to remember the greatest act of grace that was ever given to us, the gift of Jesus. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's spend some time thinking on those things and reflecting on our need for a Savior and the need for forgiveness. So let's spend a few moments in silent prayer then we'll go to God's Word. Father, we do pray that you would work in us the gospel realities of your grace. Give us the grace to see our own sin. Give us the grace to be contrite. Give us the grace, Lord, to reach out and receive salvation, forgiveness. Give us the grace, Lord, to walk in that salvation. This morning as we come to the Lord's Supper, Father, fill our minds with that great act of self-sacrifice that Christ offered on our behalf. It's in His name we pray these things. Amen. Church, as we come to the Lord's Supper this morning, a few things that I would make mention of, especially for those who may be visiting with us. As we take up the Lord's Supper, the practice that we have at our church is that our elements here, the cup and the wafer, they're all in one prepackaged um, cup. 
And so what we do is after we've read some of the scripture and prayed over the supper itself, the, the meal itself, we encourage the church family to come forward in your own time, in your own pace, come forward with others and receive the elements and then go back to your seat and partake in those elements um, in your time as well. The worship team is going to lead some music as we do so and we'll give you some time to partake in those elements and after the church has partaken in those elements, we'll finish with another song. So for those of us who uh, maybe haven't done this or done it in this way before, I'd encourage you to uh, come forward and partake with us. If you know Christ, even if this is something that's a little bit new or different to you, if you're a believer and you know Him, this is part of the right that you have to come and partake in uh, communion today. So uh, we'd encourage you to do that with us as a church family. The book of 1 Corinthians, the Word of God, gives us the tradition of taking up the Lord's Supper. It says in chapter 11, verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're mindful of what each of the elements represent for us as we partake in them. The bread or the wafer that we take symbolizes the body of Christ. A body that was hung on a cross, a body that was broken, a body that was offered up on your behalf so that you wouldn't have to die in that way or in that place or because of your sin. But instead, you're welcomed into the body of Christ, that is, the church, to die to self and to live for Him, no longer having to bear the penalty of your own sin. This is what the bread or the wafer reminds us of. And then the cup or the juice that we partake in reminds us of the blood of Jesus. The blood that was poured out by Christ on our behalf so that sin could be forgiven. So that God would look upon the death of Jesus and know it's effective. It really does bring atonement. It really does provide forgiveness. So we partake together in these two elements, the bread and the cup. As I pray and after I'm done praying, you'll be invited to come forward and take, partake together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of salvation that Christ offered on our behalf. We thank you, Father, that we can come into your presence boldly knowing that his work is finished. It is sufficient and effective to save us. So we don't participate in this act of communion for the sake of our salvation or in order to save us. We participate in it, Lord, as an act of celebration and worship for what you've already done. And so thank you, Father. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on our behalf, to die um, a cruel death on a cross, that his blood was poured out, in such a satisfactory way that sin would be completely atoned for. So, Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know you or hasn't come to know you, personally accepted you as their Savior, I pray that maybe even this morning as, as they see the church participate in communion, they might get a glimpse, Lord, of your grace and understand what it means to turn their life over to you and accept what Christ has done for them. For those of us, Lord, who do know you, I, I pray that our hearts will be filled with joy. Father, they may have been weighted down with that heavy burden of sin this morning as we had the message that dealt with David's sin. And upon reflection, maybe we are feeling weighted down as well. So, Father, I pray that in light of what the communion table offers, we're reminded that we do not have to remain under that burden or weight of guilt. We can come to you freely and be accepted. For this, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
invite you to sing in closing, He will hold me fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, we pray that we would be encouraged with how your hand does not fail, how you hold us, how you keep us, despite what we may have done or gone through. We thank you for the example of David, as tragic as it is in this particular chapter. Remind us, Lord, of the peril of sin. But Father, it might be we lastly be reminded on the great gift of grace that you've given us. Thank you for holding us. Thank you for keeping us. And send us now into this week with your grace and mercy. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.